Top Bird Talk. Monty Mython here. As we prepare to move into the next phase of the COVID crisis, we're going to be widening our focus here on Top Bird Talk. We will continue to deliver COVID-specific programmes, but we all have a huge additional responsibility as we try to reboot normal services. So although this piece is not directly related to COVID-19, we believe it's information that is crucial to the bigger task of rebuilding the healthcare system as we learn to adapt and live with this new virus. Thank you to our sponsors and to you, our listeners, for helping us to share this important information. Hello, I'm Joff Lacey and welcome to Top Med Talk and this is our special series of podcasts on Extreme Everest, the groundbreaking research program that for the past decade has pursued a novel approach to scientific exploration, performing large-scale healthy volunteer studies at high altitude to mimic the effects of critical illness with the hope that their findings may be brought from the mountainside to the bedside and improve the care for our sickest patients. In these podcasts, we will take you through the story of Extreme Everest, from its inception to its discoveries, and to the future of this unique endeavour. I'm pleased to say I'm joined by Professor Chris Imray, a consultant in vascular and transplant surgery at University Hospitals Coventry and Warwickshire in the UK, who was not only a member of the Extreme Everest Research Group, but also a member of the team summiting in the first expedition in 2007. Chris, many thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure to talk to you. We've been exploring in these series about Extreme Everest's objectives to better understand how the body adapts and changes to the hypoxic conditions of altitude. Now, you've been focusing on one of the most vital of organs, the brain. Can you explain to us what our understanding is about how the brain does cope in those quite austere environment of high altitude and hypoxic conditions? Thank you very much indeed, and it's lovely to be here. The brain is a very sensitive organ and requires a high level of oxygen and glucose delivered on a continuous basis and any interruption in that will start to cause a very rapid deterioration in cerebral function. You can look at two different situations when one goes to altitude. The situation where you're in an aeroplane and you have explosive decompression and a very rapid exposure to the altitude Or you can have a much slower approach where you travel slowly up through the hills, climbing up the mountains, and there you are able to acclimatise and adapt. And really what we were looking at on Everest was this much slower approach. And we did a number of studies there, but in particular we were looking at cerebral blood flow, cerebral oxygen delivery, and also some neuropsychometric tests trying to work out how the brain was actually functioning. And so as the brain is dependent and very quite greedy with its oxygen and glucose requirements, what are the normal physiological responses that we see as someone experiences those kind of conditions? In the situation where you're going up more slowly in a mountain setting, the first symptom that people are likely to get is something called a high-altitude headache. Mm-hmm. And that will occur usually within the first six to eight hours or so. And it's often quite confusing. It could be something else. You could just have a headache. You could be a bit dehydrated. But once you've addressed those, and in the context of recent ascent to altitude, you would define that as a high-altitude headache. The next clinical scenario that can be problematic is something called acute mountain sickness, and this will occur usually after 24 to 72 hours, above about 3,000 metres roughly, and there there's a bit of a lethargy starts to come on, feeling of vague nausea, just not feeling quite right, a bit of dizziness, perhaps a bit of breathlessness, and that, if you don't ascend any further, is likely to be self-limiting. The really serious condition that can affect people who go up higher and usually occurs on probably about day three to seven or so, probably at altitudes nearer five, six thousand metres, is something called high altitude cerebral edema. And this is where the brain begins to swell inside the confines of the fixed cranial vault. And as the brain swells there, the oxygen delivery deteriorates rapidly, the individual becomes ataxic, they start to have cerebral signs and changing levels of consciousness, coma and eventually death will ensue. So those are the three major conditions that would affect us in terms of the brain. And do we know what are the underlying, what is the underlying pathology to those conditions? Is it part of the normal response or is it a poor response that leads to that? Do we have a better understanding? So that's a really interesting question. What we know is as soon as you are exposed to lower altitudes, in order to maintain cerebral oxygen delivery, there tends to be an increase in the cerebral blood flow. 
increased cerebral blood flow also requires increased drainage and this possibly accounts for some of the headaches. Once one starts to move into the high altitude cerebral edema and the acute mountain sickness, then it's a rather more different sort of situation. Mm. It's possibly a continuum where the acute mountain sickness is the start of the problem and the high altitude cerebral edema is a continuation. Other people believe it's separate. But here, one starts to get leaky membranes, one starts to get excess fluid leaking into the parenchyma of the brain and the gradual swelling, which then can deteriorate in certain individuals. Quite why it occurs, we still don't know. It seems to be worsened by rapid ascent. It seems to be some people are more susceptible than others. And there is some suggestion that there's a little bit more capacity in the older climber within the cranial vault for the brain to expand. And so it's possibly younger climbers that are more susceptible to high altitude cerebral edema in particular. Young people are likely to be a little Ah, more susceptible because they have less space around their brain for the brain to swell, so they are going to reach the limit of compliance, the ability of the brain to swell within a fixed space at an earlier stage. Do we know for certain how to kind of risk stratify those that may develop these complications, or is it an unknown? It's an unknown. I mean, we on the first expedition, we went to Choyoyu, Mark Wilson, and Nikki Koshelton did some studies trying to measure cranial vault capacity to work out whether or not there was a susceptibility to that and they found no relationship. What we have done was work on a novel hypothesis as a result of some of the studies we did where we showed increased blood flow and changes in the arterial side. We began to explore the venous component, the venous drainage and we did some nice studies at Queen Square looking at MRV, magnetic resonance venography, and found that the anatomy of the venous drainage in people who were more susceptible appeared to be different, and they tended to have a dominant on one side and an atrophic venous drainage system that might have caused backflow and increased edema. Right, so their ability to drain that increased blood flow was impaired and therefore you've got the increased swelling. Yes, I mean, that's not been replicated by other teams, but we do think the venous outflow hypothesis is an important component, and it does fit into translational areas where there's certain brain conditions where this is a particular problem, and people have actually attempted to improve venous drainage to the brain to relieve these sorts of situations. So would you mind going into a bit more detail about specifically the projects you did on the brain on the Extreme Everest expedition? We did a couple. The first and the one that sort of stands out to me in particular was the cerebral perfusion study where we're using a technique called a transcranial duplex to measure the blood flow within the middle cerebral artery. In the past, people have used transcranial Doppler where one measures the velocity of the blood in the middle cerebral artery and here we were measuring diameter as well using duplex techniques. Now, knowing the velocity is interesting... But without knowing the diameter, you can't calculate the flow. But Mm. by knowing the two of those, you can calculate very readily. And then by knowing the saturations and the hematocrit, you can then work out oxygen delivery. The fascinating thing about that particular study was the way in which we demonstrated a very marked increase in the middle cerebral artery at extreme altitude. So we're talking at 8,000 metres here. And it was a bit of a eureka moment when we were doing the scans on the South Coal and discovered this huge artery that, I must say, I was concerned whether I could even pick up the artery under those conditions. And there it was, just standing out, absolutely giant. And one of the questions, was this some fault in the machinery? Was I scanning incorrectly? Had I, what was wrong? And what I wanted to do was to try and challenge that and see whether there was a way of reversing it. And since we had supplementary oxygen, it was relatively straightforward to take the subject who was on ambient air and put an oxygen mask on them, and within a minute, the artery had returned to normal size. So we were able to make... uh, how much bigger was the middle cerebral artery? It was roughly twice the diameter it was. So if you double the diameter, you increase the flow through the tube by 16-fold. There's an enormous increase in flow. And that is significantly mitigated by the very high hematocrit and the sludgy, treacle-like blood. But this appears to be an important adaptation that allows us to travel to those altitudes. Up until this point in time, everyone had assumed the middle cerebral artery was fixed in diameter and didn't change. Now, that's an interesting idea, and you can see why using the technique of transcranial um, Doppler, where you 
don't have diameter, it was a convenient assumption to make. But there are 150 plus papers where they've assumed no change in diameter. But quite why the middle cerebral artery should be unlike any other artery in the body, middle sized artery, and not dilate doesn't really make sense and actually it was just an opportune scan plus the use of oxygen that allowed us to tease that bit of information out. And so this was the first time that this kind of scan had been done at such an altitude? Yes indeed I mean the technique had only just been developed at that stage. We had a very nice bit of kit from a company called Sonosite who lent us a couple of machines and it was fully portable and we were able to do these measurements. There was some initial questioning by others in the field as to whether or not you got accurate measurements. But when we came back, we then replicated the study back at sea level using hypoxic stimulus inside an MR scanner and found the same things, not obviously to the same magnitude, but we were able to demonstrate changes in middle cerebral artery diameter based upon hypoxic exposure. And did you have any information or do you have any hypotheses as to whether that is a beneficial response or whether there's a limit at which it becomes detrimental or whether it differed between those that did well and didn't? Was that so we, thoughts on that? We only had very small numbers there were in that particular study. They were all doing fine, so it's difficult to know whether that is the way someone who's performing well at extreme altitude behaves or not. These were all people who had been to high altitude before regularly. And these were people who went on to summit yeah. the next day, so they were <laughs> so doing well. well. acclimatised, yeah. I mean, I think the theoretical concerns is major changes in the diet of the middle cerebral artery may or may not be serious in its own right. You do wonder whether or not increased diameter might increase leakage and could be a problem. The other concern is if you've got any underlying pathology, so if you can imagine someone with a small aneurysm and you suddenly start to double the diameter of the vessel, this could have potentially catastrophic events, but that's hypothetical. And as you also mentioned earlier, the relationship with then the venous outflow, you know, if you've one entry point, but also if the exit isn't able to balance that, then that could be part of the problem. So I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, the pressure inside the cranial vault in the arteries is obviously very close to the systemic arterial pressure and that will find whatever size it needs to. The problem as the brain swells is it will tend to press in on the CSF and Mm. the veins. Now the CSF cerebrospinal fluid is not crucial to cerebral oxygen delivery in the short term but if you could imagine starting to squeeze the outflow, the way in which the blood gets out of the brain, we now get a situation where we've got blood going in under high pressure but is struggling to get out. And certainly in other situations like a leg, if you put a tight venous tourniquet on, uh, you will start to get edema in the leg. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to imagine that the same sort of situation could occur inside the brain. Now, the bottom line to all these projects is trying to improve patient care. How do you translate your findings back to the hospital patient and how we might improve care for these critically ill patients. A lot of my work over the years has been on carotid surgery. This is an operation where one makes a two to three inch cut in the side of the neck over the carotid artery to open up and clear out a narrowed artery, the aim being to prevent or reduce the risk of future stroke. Now, Cerebral oxygen delivery is a crucial component to this operation because at some point you have to clamp the artery, which then means that the flow either has to come from the collaterals or will become inadequate. And we use a number of approaches. One can either do the procedure under general anaesthetic and put a shunt, a plastic tube in to maintain the flow, or one can do it under local anaesthetic and see how the patient gets on and try to start to titrate the different anaesthetic approaches, increasing the blood pressure or the inspired oxygen levels to try to ameliorate the degradation in the cerebral function. So by understanding cerebral oxygen delivery, we've come up with a number of approaches which we feel reduces the risk of this sort of surgery. My colleague Mark Wilson, who was the lead for the cerebral side of the Extreme Everest team, is a neurosurgeon and again he's had various insights and approaches which has allowed him to undertake neurosurgery in a safer way. So there are some immediate benefits that have come out quite soon and I think there may be other ones coming shortly but it's an ongoing project. We're now 10 years since that very exciting discovery of the middle cerebral artery swelling And even now, I don't think we've fully understood the implications. And so what are your next steps? Are you planning to go back? There's more studies planned with relation to the brain. So the next study that we've got is a phase one study that we're doing in Coventry shortly, where we're going to use a model that we used earlier to take 
healthy volunteers, mostly medical students, and put them in a hypoxic chamber for 24 hours and actually induce cerebral edema. We've done that already. What we're going to do this time is randomise them to a dose of intravenous dexamethasone or normal saline to see whether or not we can, first of all, mitigate the development of cerebral edema and secondly, get some idea as to the mechanisms by which dexamethasone, which is the drug usually used for high-altitude cerebral edema, how it might work. So this will be starting in the next four months or so, and uh, we're excited to see where that goes. This may or may not have relevance clinically. I mean, the question is whether or not some of our patients undergoing neurosurgical interventions, vascular interventions, might benefit from it. That's a hypoxic study we're doing. The other thing we're beginning to look at is trying to work out some of the ways to mitigate either brain or cord swelling in major vascular surgery. Procedures in particular that are at risk are endovascular thoracic aneurysm repairs where one is manipulating wires inside the thoracic aorta and can shower off debris, but also you can occlude vessels that supply the spinal cord. And so, again, we're going to be looking at ways in which we may be able to mitigate the effect of that. So plenty of work still to come. Very much so. <laughs> Professor Imray, thanks very much for your time. That's all we've got time for now. You can visit the website, www.topmedtalk.com, to see and hear the rest of the podcasts. And there's plenty of other material there for your interest. But that's it from us for now. Thank you very much for Top listening. Top Med Talk.